Welcome to our second session of uh, Prevailing Within a Black Swan Event. Uh, if you're curious about what a black swan event is, or if you're curious about our previous webcast, you're welcome to beam into the recording that, uh, that we did that's available on multiple sites, including IPEDO. Now, I would like to mention that if you are having any problem with the quality of our presentation, that um, it is likely because of the number of people logged into Zoom, account, uh, Zoom accounts across the cosmos. Uh, if, there are, if there are people also on the internet where you are located, that can really slow things down. If there are other people in your house or in your office where you are right now, that will really slow things down. So just be aware that we really have done everything we can to have a high quality audio and video presentation. Um, if you would like to take a photograph or a screenshot, these are our emails. I'll give you just a moment to do that. Uh, all of us certainly do appreciate the uh, fantastic feedback that we've received from people. I was just telling uh, the crew here that it's a bit daunting when you hear from people that they've been running in circles and feel like they're in the deepest ocean in a boat that's gaining water with no paddles and uh, they're kind of going down and then they hear something like what we had to say and um, they're starting to walk upright. So that, that's what it's all about for us. From the last presentation, um, we decided that there were three highlights uh, that we would like to just remind you of. Uh, these would come under the headings of promises to yourself, because as you recall, the last um, presentation centered on, on leadership. Um, one of the comments that we wanted to review with you is leadership needs to be compassionate and uh, personal contact with team members to let them know uh, that you care about them and that you want to maintain contact with them if there are any people in a personal crisis that you consider to be valuable team members. Uh, those people need to be uh, know that you are there for them, just like you've always been there for the children that you treat and the, the patients that you treat. Another point uh, that was we would like to emphasize is the importance for personal fitness and feeling strong literally uh, and without being strong physically or feel if you feel weak physically, it's just not possible to feel strong mentally and to um, be up for the troubles that are we're still within. People call these challenges um, that I, I think that's a little tiring for me. I, I see them, they are problems and um, giving into the problems it's not the example that you would set for your children. It's not the example that your parents would want to set for you. And it's certainly not an example that is acceptable in these very, very difficult times. Um, Martha Ann uh, wanted to make a comment about the science of well being. Martha Ann? Well, I'm going to give credit to um, one of my great friends, Jed Best, who um, turned me on to. Dr. Laurie Santos, who's a professor at Yale, who at the current moment has 1.7 million people across the globe taking her free course on Coursera. So you can see the um, website that you can link onto it and log through it and just um, go through um, all of her modules about the science behind happiness. And I just find it fantastic and a great thing, I think, to share with your staff. Um, so that's just another great resource. But yeah, could to Jed for finding it. If you, um, if you just put in the science of well-being in a search, this will pop up. I've, I've done that. Put them in two separate ones. I made a center to Jed, so I can call him soon and talk to him. Hmm. Sounds like a little bit of cross-town traffic there. The other um, thing is, is that I think, Phil, didn't you make the chat active? Is it, can people chat in and then as time allows, we can, deal, we can um, answer some of these things, is that right? Yeah, they can, people can definitely chat. Okay, good. 
Uh, this will be our uh, next scheduled uh, seminar and captain of that particular event will be um, the effervescent and lovely Martha Ann Keels on connecting with patient families. So that's the date, that's the day, and that is the time. We got it together, didn't we? <laughs> come on, come on. You gotta be, you gotta get with it. We definitely got our thing together. Though. Come on, baby. Get it to me. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Um, uh, let's see. I need to um, stop screen sharing, I guess, or is that stopped? Are we in good shape here? Perfect. Is that good? Yes? Yes. <clears throat> All right, Melissa, it's your turn. Oots, oots, oots. That's it. <laughs> All right, uh, Bobby, um, this is um, the effervescent and lovely Bob Lee, Bobby, but a Bob Lee, Bob Lee Elliott on um, team leadership during the crisis. Bobby. Thanks uh, everybody for, for showing up today and taking time out of your day. Um, this is one that's near and dear to the four of our hearts and, and certainly we know the importance of um, taking care of our team um, in the, in the the time frame that we have today, it's impossible to go through everything we want to say, but we have tried, we've tried to break this down into um, five bullet points, um, and we'll go through each one of these. So the first one is connection and communication with your team, the importance of staying connected. The second one is being able to lead with a confident plan. The third is going to be team psychology, the things to say to your team and the things not to say to your team. Uh, the fourth one is going to be expectations of the team and the dedication of you as the doctor. And then finally, um, scripted communication with patients. Um, so those five things are the ones that we really want to talk about today. Uh, I believe the first thing that is most important when we talk about connection when communication with your team is genuine compassion. Um, they need to know that you have not abandoned them through this. Um, we may look at this as that we have a lot of our own problems to deal with with the office from a financial standpoint, um, from a, a daily schedule standpoint, these Zoom meetings, trying to learn as much as we can about what the future of our practice looks like, but we can't forget that our team is not involved in those things. And the only thing that connects them to our practice is us as their leader. So it's important for us to stay connected to them. Um, in the last few days that, that the four of us have been chatting daily, which I've absolutely loved uh, and look forward to that, um, we've come up with some ideas of what we do with our own team members and, and talking to our other colleagues. Um, weekly Zoom meetings like this, I think are imperative um, or even more often than that, but I feel like it's important for everyone to um, reach out to your team, whether it's FaceTime or Zoom, but that you have some type of connection where you can do updates, they can hear what's been going on, but just to have fun as well. That, you know, show, let everybody know what's going on with your family. Is everybody healthy? Uh, what, what's everybody been doing to stay sane through this? Um, Martha and you guys have been doing something fun, playing games in your, with your team. Can you tell us more about that? Well, we divided the um, office up into three teams of six people and just doing, um, and each team is challenging the other one to trying to figure out a puzzle, or kind of a virtual scavenger hunt. And then at the end, whoever wins, we had a pile of um, gift cards, $10 gift cards to Starbucks. We really were part of our oops gift for when we were late seeing a patient. So obviously we're not late seeing anybody at the moment. So we recycled those for rewarding the staff. And so we, that's just fun. And they're really getting into it. And I think what's really humbling is to have the staff say how much they miss seeing each other. So I think staying connected is so important. Bill, do you, uh, how about on your side? Uh, remind us of how many, um, how many team yeah. members you have, uh, team plus docs on the team. Yeah, so we have 32 full-time team members and then a, and a few other, like well, I think six part-time, but you know, with a team as large as ours, you know, we've kind of had different cohorts that have been getting together on Zoom. And, you know, I think it's funny. Can you imagine if this, if something like this would have happened 
without having the access to the internet and, and the ability to do this type of, you know, it's funny when you think about how many things perpetuate technology into society, you know, how many events that do that. I think we're going to see a lot of change, but you know, my team's doing the same thing that, that the other teams are doing. I, I think, I think that's the nice part is that zoom is such a great platform that if your team is large, you can use it. And if it's small, you can see the main point that, that we're trying to bring home is that if you haven't had a meeting with your team virtually yet, then, then you need to, um, you know, even if it's just to talk about where people are at, where you as the doctor, where you as the leader really don't say anything other than how are you and let them lead the conversation and just support them. That's going to go a long way. Yeah. Try to I, make it consistent as well. Each week, ours is Thursday at 730 and it's a happy hour. I mean, make it fun. <laughs> right? So, but consistency is important so that they can plan in their schedule as well to, to attend. And again, it's not mandatory, but it does help the communication stay strong and, and the, the ties that bind stay strong as well. So when, Gary, you, speak, you, were gonna say something. when you say 730, uh, and you lifted up that glass. Are you, are you guys like Duncan at 7.30 in the morning? No, at Just, night. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, actually uh, Jeffrey Broerman was mentioning to me the other day that he's had a, um, uh, like a, I don't know, virtual disco or cocktail party. And uh, it was the, all, the entire purpose was uh, we're going to get down and have some fun. And of course, um, there's no problem with calling an Uber, is there? <laughs> so I, um, I thought that was a great idea, but as, as, far, as far as a, a team meeting where you're about to discuss protocols, um, which we're going to be doing this time around, um, what about that, Bobby? What about the actual- I'm not sure if this is the time for that. I, I don't think it's the time for that yet. I think this is a time to keep connection strong with lighthearted, fun, genuine concern about how everybody's doing in their personal lives. I think that's going to come in the pre-recovery phase when we start to get closer to knowing an opening date that we can start strategizing. And Martha Ann's going to talk about that next Tuesday at noon. But I think this is more of just stay connected from the heart right now with your team. There's been some really great take-home points that I'd like to just go through for everybody to write down um, one of them is to, to individually text your team members and ask them how they're doing financially. Um, it's across the board right now about these stimulus checks and unemployment that's being received. Um, I needed to know individually with my team who had another spouse that was bringing an income in or who lived at home with their parents. Um, we have two team members. One has um, both parents unemployed. So they have no income coming in outside of unemployment. And my other team member is a single mom who has grown children. She lives by herself, but she uh, was going to apply for food stamps the other day. So for me personally, and this is a personal choice, but I needed to know um, what their situation was because I chose to put some cash in their Venmo account so that I know they had groceries and that they weren't stressed. So, and that's not to say, look at me, look at me. It's to encourage you to check in with your team so that the team knows individually that you're, you're checking on, on their well-being. Um, so is that, um, I'm just curious because I, I can't imagine other people aren't uh, thinking the same thing. Is that a bit of an invitation? If you need money, let me know, uh, or don't you see it that way? I know my team well enough that I don't think any of them would ever take advantage of me like that, but it was important for me to be able to put my head on my pillow at night to know that nobody was stressing on where's the food going to come from. Martha Ann, do you have a comment about that? Well, I'm doing the same thing though. I had two staff, one selling a house and one buying a house. So um, the one buying was in the midst of closing on, I think, March 31st or losing track of time, March 27th, then if I put her on unemployment, her husband is a hygienist and he was put on unemployment, I had to be mindful if I had done that with her, she would have lost her loan and they were already out of their apart, you know, had already signed out of their apartment. So there were individual issues that I did exactly the same thing as Bobby trying to identify who, you know, who's got a double income, who's not, I mean, I've got staff that have had their husbands furloughed so I think each, each staff's got a different issue and including, you know, even our 
young doctors, if you've got young doctors with loans and making sure all of that, they're being taken care of as well. They're being taken care of in what way specifically? I mean, let me, let me, uh, I give you a hit of a role play. What if um, I'm a team member and I said, well, Dr. Keels actually financially, um, I, I could use a couple thousand dollars um, at the minimum. Can you help me with that? I haven't had that request yet. I mean, I think. But some people out there are, I would imagine people are thinking that could happen. I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had that issue. I mean, I think, I think I'd like to back up and say prevention. I think this is a great teaching lesson for all aspects of of us to make sure you've got three months. Some people now argue six months of money saved to survive something like this, because who's to say the next one won't be sooner. But um, I was fortunate that I would say most of my staff lived by that rule that they were okay, um, that they had saved and they weren't, um, they weren't asking me for anything like that. Well, um, Phil, Phil, let's say that's not the case. Let's say that uh, hypothetically, that a team member did say that, and they were very blunt. They said, you know, if you could just see your way to give me three or $5,000, it would really help me. What would you say to that, Phil? You know, everyone's gonna have their own choice. I think the issue boils down to what, how, what happens if you say yes, because at least in situations where this, I mean, look, this has happened to a lot of doctors, not just during a crisis, this happens you know, employees and team members have financial troubles at different times. And I've heard different stories. We've kind of, in our own practice, we've had our own ones that came up. You treat each one individually. I think the issue sometimes boils down to you as, a, as an owner, you as a doctor, or you as a friend. Like, if you cross that boundary and loan them money, I think the issue needs to boil down where you accept the fact that you're not going to get that back. I think it's- That's right. That's I, right. I think, yeah, I think you have to have the mental, it's- you have to have you have to go into that knowing that do not ask for that back and and even if that employee were then to even become a challenging employee in the future and ask you again you have to let that go say no. you have to you have to be you prepared say no also. yeah right you can say no but i think i tend to hear we all we all value our team especially you know when you've got a team that's hum, you know it's been together you know we're a 45 plus year old practice with team multiple team members that have been with us for 20, 30, you know, some even 40 years. And there are things you're gonna do for those team members that you might not do for others and everyone has their unique circumstance. But I think the, the, the take home message is just be prepared, give that money freely and don't expect to get it back. If, yeah, you're, gonna if, that. You're, if you're willing to do that, don't expect, you could say yeah. it's an advance on your, on your holiday bonus or something like this. But a, I think you need to be loaded up with some sort of reply rather than uh, you know, kind of spinning in a circle. Well, let me think about that. I, I don't think that that's um, the best way to handle it. Now, one response um, that I have given, not during this crisis, uh, a personal friend was, he was really in a bad situation and he, we all know the fable of the grasshopper and the ant. Well, this guy's a grasshopper and uh, he didn't sock away any money. And I said to him, you know, I don't want to burden you with my own problems, my own responsibilities for my family. And I'm really sorry I can't do that. Is there another way I can help? And that did it. And to this day, this was quite a while ago. This, this is not a dentist. To this day, this, uh, this fellow and I are really close friends. Um, let's, circle Bobby? Back. let's circle back about a couple of other um, pearls to take home about this connection and communication. Um, if you have the ability to, to create a Facebook page for just your team, a private group page, that's another great way to communicate um, through the week. We, I make sure that I post at least three positive messages a week to the team, but that's a, just another great platform to be able to communicate in. Uh, I've had some good friends talk about group projects that they did. Jessica Miski just, just texted and Melissa McHenry did uh, a great project um, where they're all doing care packages to one another, just very simple things from around the house. Um, I've, on Facebook, I've also seen where everyone's making a sign to their patients or doing a short video um, and they're making a collage out of that. Those are all fantastic things to do that doesn't take much effort. 
Um, but I think that's just another way to reach out and stay connected to your team. Uh, we talked about this yes, uh, on, on um, Tuesday that Admin Appreciation Day is next Wednesday. Um, please take five minutes to write your admin team members a note and get it in the mail today so that they get that next Wednesday just to say, I appreciate you. I'm sorry that we're going through this, um, but I'm, I'm here for you and I appreciate all that you provide to the practice in terms of dedication and effort. So don't forget that for next Wednesday. Any comment about uh, the, the handwritten note thing? Um, Good. A very close friend of mine, um, uh, Mike. Okay, Schmeichel. so that would be good for the communication and connection portion of it. Uh, the second one is to lead with a confident plan. Go ahead. You're jumping. Sorry, audio went out. Yeah, yours went out too. Anyway, go ahead, Bobby. All right, so the second, the second big topic is to lead with a confident plan. Um, Tuesday, we referenced uh, Marcus Buckingham, um, who said great leaders have a great vision. Um, there's also a book um, that I believe Simon Sinek wrote called Leaders Eat Last. Um, if you haven't read that, that is a fantastic book um, that talks about taking care of people. Um, <laughs> His mantra is, if you take care of people, the numbers will come. And so it, look, look that up on Amazon and get that. It's a great book. Um, but we need to make sure that when we present ourselves in front of our team, scripted on how we find our confidence with our team. Phil, what have you guys done with your leadership team um, to get ready and be prepared for when it's time to have a plan to come back? Primarily just starting to have those conversations. You know, I, I think um, it's going to take a lot of talking and a lot of talking through scenarios and a lot of talking through fears. Like right now we're in the process of having the leadership team engage with all the different team members to find out who's afraid to come back and what their fears are and start figuring out where people are at mentally as a team. And then we as a leadership team are going to start talking about what our new policies or procedures are as best we can. But I think I think if I was going to stress one thing, it's that there's a lot of conversations we're going to need to have. And as, and as dentists, you know, it's tough for us to sometimes fit meetings into our busy day. So we're not used to sometimes having lots of meetings. Well, it's going to take a lot of, I think to do this right, it's going to take a lot of meetings and it's going to take a lot of conversations and um, more conversations than we're used to having. And if you haven't done you should feel as if you've done too many conversations to feel like you're most prepared for this. So I think, so right now we're just starting to have all the conversations and we're, you know, my, my job is to make sure that we're heading in the right direction, which is right now we're in assessment to get idea of where's the team at, where's the team at, yeah. you know, for being willing to come back. You know, we talked about confidence and I want to ask everybody a very serious question. Do you believe that you're going to be okay? Because if you don't, you aren't ready to get in front of your team. You have to believe that you're going to come through this and that everybody's going to learn along the way and we're gonna be better at some point down the road, but you have to be confident that you're going to be okay before you can say to the team, we're going to be okay. So find your confidence before you get in front of your team. When you do get in front of your team, be patient. It is gonna be so important to stay humble and to be patient because your team is scared. We've never expected to be off work or have our practices closed down this long. So even if we are a little fearful, we've got to be able to put that brave face on because we are their leader and we have to be confident in our approach with them. Uh, one thing I'm going to personally do and, and encourage you guys to is I'm going to cook some food before we go back and take it with me on the first day. I want to cook for my team so that they see this personal effort that's coming through. Uh, I would consider ordering lunch that first week you're back just so that it's one less stress, but it's going to be a time to get together around the lunch table and be a community together. Um, Martha Ann, what, what are some strategies you have on, on your return with your team? Because you stay, you're so good at staying connected and Phil, you as well. Um, while we're gone, but what's going to the, the strategy is you have a really great sign. I know that you made about D DSPD smiles strong. 
uh, in your team? Yeah, I mean, I just have on the door all those um, words that the team all came up with about resilience and courage, patience, um, kindness, or just words that we cut out of construction paper. And they gave me the words and then we put it up on the door. But I think the staff are being brilliant about compiling questions. So for our emergencies, most of the little kids are coming in wearing gloves. And so the, we're coming up with questions like, and so I'm turning to the American Academy of Pediatrics and saying, okay, is this gonna be something new that the kids coming in are gonna have to wear gloves? So certainly none of what I'm saying is like, I'm holding back personally, I'm doing buying anything or doing anything differently until the CDC, the ADA and JCO come Absolutely. together and kind of before I drop a dollar. But um, we're coming up with questions about, okay, what if they tell us we have to keep everyone six feet apart? Like restaurants in California, you may have heard that they may open up, but if you, they're gonna have to be spaced out more. Like what if that gets applied to us? And kind of trying to be thinking through some of these. So I'm asking them to start thinking of like, what questions do you have? I mean, obviously the ultrasonic scalar might be something we won't turn on for a while. Um, just, just, I'm just compiling a list of questions. And just so you know, if you've got questions too, you can send them to me. I'm, I'm pushing them upstream to the ADA, um, the Council on Scientific Affairs. We're meeting all the time, trying to put science behind these decisions. But I'm also just trying to get questions because I think knowledge re gives you power, but it reduces the emotion. And for me, knowledge reduces fear and helps me have that confidence in just one last little pearl that I wanted to throw in is we've also in that, like what Bobby said, um, just backing up a step is having the staff all just say, when are you running out of anything? And five of our staff ran out of toilet paper and they all had kids is one of our staff got creative and went to a restaurant. And obviously I'm in a rural North Carolina area to a restaurant and said, Oh yeah, we can buy from restaurant suppliers. And we bought a case of 100 rolls of toilet paper and then dispersed it to everybody who needed it. So giving, also having everyone on the staff coming up with, like, are you out of shampoo? Are you out of hand sanitizer? What are you out of? We'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. So serving as that creative resource, I think, is healing. Absolutely. Do, you, do you put one particular person in charge of that uh, as kind of an assignment during these times? Or how are you playing that one? Well, it's interesting that each one of them have stepped up. So in that last crisis about toilet paper, one of the hygienists said, I think I've got an idea. Let me run with it. And then the hand sanitizer, um, the dental assistant, she said, I think I got an idea. And we said, okay, you run with it. So their own, they are getting excited. I mean, the energy might run out if we're still talking like this in the middle of May and uh, you know further down the pike. But right now they're individually jumping in on, um, coming up with ideas. So yeah, that's really nice. From, uh, from that um, uh, happiness um, video, or the PowerPoint that you put together that I saw, Martha, and it was interesting that, that there, there, the woman's research shows that when you do things like this, it's, uh, it makes you feel quite um, at peace and that you're doing something very, very good for someone. Bobby? Yeah, I, I want to underscore a, a very important point that Martha Ann said. We need to be guided by the science and by our recommendations from our governing bodies. Um, and we don't know what that is going to be yet. So we need to encourage our team to understand we may not have the answers to their questions yet about how the clinical side is going to look like or the schedule is going to look like. We can, we can take their question, but don't go down the rabbit hole of trying to guess with an answer right now. Just table that, but let them know they can communicate those questions with you. Um, but right now, we just we, we don't know what it's going to look like. Let me uh, jump in on that. I received an uh, um, email from a pediatric dentist uh, actually yesterday, and this was an emergency situation for a patient not of record. Uh, abscess and the parents were uh, quite uh, angry and um, non the parents were quite non-cooperative. The kid followed suit and was also non-cooperative. But the question specifically was, what about distance informed consent? If you're doing some, Larry Gerald, the attorney orthodontist who writes the litigation column every month for the American 
Journal of Orthodontics and a quite a close friend of mine said, you know, if you do something by distance using your phone, photographs, you have established a doctor patient relationship. Now, to just underscore what Bobby just said, no one has uh, risk management informed consent forms be, for the situation that we have found ourselves in. So there, there may, I hope the academy is trying to develop it, but nobody has that right now. Um, yeah. Now, I don't, I don't want to get into that sidebar, Bobby, but as far as the staff and what you should do, um, as you just said, there, there's no rules of engagement. That's right. We just, we don't know yet, so we can't make an informed decision. All right, so let's move to team psychology. Let's talk about the third point. Um, the take home message here is no negative thoughts, no negative energy. You're a confident leader, so make sure that this stays up and positive. Jerry, you're shaking your head because we know the importance. We cannot yeah. let negativity come into this. I'm seeing some, some posts on IPDO about some pretty negative questions that are on there. And it's just not the right thing to, to post up there. This needs to be positive. How can we help each other? Uplifting thoughts. Um, but, but let's talk about what to say to your team when you get back. Psychologically, the most important thing you can do is acknowledge their fear. Acknowledge yeah. that this has been an emotional fracture for all of us. Get it on the table, acknowledge that they are scared, and then move forward from that. Um, Tuesday, we referenced about um, pulling our bootstraps up. We, have, we can remind our team that we have been through challenges before, and we sure the hell aren't going to let this one take us down. We're going to do everything we can to fight, and we're going to fight hard. Also important to acknowledge that we're going to grow into a new. We've got to let go of the past. We will never go back likely to where we were. So we have to acknowledge that we are going to have a new normal, but we're going to have a new normal together and we're going to get through this successfully. I also am a strong believer that you need a verbal affirmation, a commitment from each of your team members that they are getting on the boat because the boat's going to sail, but you need to make sure that you have a verbal commitment from each one of your team members without any hesitation. Them seeing you command your boat as a captain because the boat's going to leave is going to, I think, encourage them to get on board and to, to let's do this. Let's, let's do this. We are a team and we're going to make this happen. Um, any comments on that, Phil? You're so good about, about that with your, with your team and, and, and Martha Ann as well. No, Bob, I'm just going to echo what you said, Bobby. I think this, is, this continues in my mind to be one of those unprecedented times as a leader where we are where you're really going to have to put your foot down on certain things in your office. You know, I think I just, I just told one of my team members when we were dealing with an emergency this morning, I go, you know, cause we kept our leadership team on, like that's who's, that's who's keeping us afloat right now. We furloughed um, like 30 plus people. And then we kept our leadership team. Um, as I said, you know, this was an event that allowed our leadership team to get tight. And we have been doing a cultural realignment in our office. And it's difficult when you bring a leader up because you have to learn to establish new boundaries. And I, I kind of gave her a heads up and I said, you know, what's gonna happen when we start bringing the team back is they're gonna probably see on behalf of us leaders and especially some of us owner doctors, um, a little bit more accountability than what they're used to because this is a time where we can't necessarily relax. Now that doesn't mean being uncharitable, not being nice or mean, but it's being able to lead with that sense of confidence like you so beautifully described. And, and that's where, you know, like what we alluded to on Tuesday, like if what we're saying to you to the people who are listening, like this is in this uncomfortable, this is making you feel a little uncomfortable. Well, that's, that's a good thing, but reach out to the people who can give you the strength because it will make this transition so much easier. If you can just hold your team accountable, hold yourself accountable and your office will, will be better for this. It'll, it'll percolate into other aspects too, that, that you were struggling with. So. I agree. And um, you, with this team psychology, topic, I think the priority that you also lead with is safety. Safety has to be paramount for the team, for us as the providers, and for the patients. But we need to instill that sense of safety with the team that we want to make sure they know that we have their best interest at heart. Jerry, you were really big on that when we talked on Tuesday. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's where most of this is coming from. Uh, 
with uh, the black virus is that um, people feel they don't feel safe at all be, and they feel unsafe because there is no predictability there's no set plan and um, I, I would caution people from too often saying well we've never been here before that that that's being said so often that it is it's certainly not confidence inspiring uh, a, a lot more of this is this is the plan. Well, when the, when the team says, well, when are we getting back to the office? This was mentioned yesterday. When the, um, when the safety people of the government, when the CDC and OSHA and who's ever making these uh, infectious disease decisions says, this is the protocol, that is when we will get back to the office because of safety. Um, any comment about that, Bobby? Martha Ann? I can say something to that. Um, just giving an example of the major medical center I work with, um, you know, they sent out an email saying, we're 7,000 surgeries behind, we're losing lots of money, we're going to need to ramp up really fast. Well, that created a huge amount of anxiety. Yes. And so I've stopped saying, I'm going to be ramping up, we've got to catch up. I think a strong core of this that we ought to keep alive is work-life balance. And I'm still trying to figure out how to communicate with my team, but I'm just going to say, trying to say like being careful about, okay, we're going to be working seven, six days a week instead of four and a half or like tr trying to figure out like factoring in that we also can't afford to get sick in this quote ramp up and get your own immune system in a hot mess. So I think it's um, trying to figure out a, a compromise between trying to catch up in a way and and then at the same time keeping a balance of um, taking deep breaths and not pushing putting the you know the pedal to the metal at the full tilt and I think saying you know what's the most trying to communicate what's the most efficient way that we can see patients and still maintain our sanity and our health and yeah. uh, recognizing that some of our staff are probably still going to be teaching their kids at home because there's discussion now, at least in our state, that kids may be about out all the way through the fall. So that's creating anxiety. But I think ramping up, you know, fix, fit, fitting all these patients, that conversation probably needs to be at a doctor level and your office manager level, and then trying to sort out how to best communicate that so it's in a gentle, kind way. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and you just talked about communication. Um, Let's talk about what the flip side, what not to say to our teams when we get back. Um, it is very important to not say, don't worry about that, or that there's nothing to worry about. Um, one of the most offensive things you can say is to calm down or stay calm. Never tell anybody to calm down or stay calm. Um, I think the other thing that is important is to remember to, that your humility goes a long way. This is a very important time to stay humble. Do not discuss how this has affected your personal finances. Do not discuss how you missed your vacation or a family trip or your own family issues. This is not about us when we go back to our team. We can use each other for those conversations, the doctors, but that is not a time to go back to your team and, and not be humble. And not discuss death rates or any other negative figures that are out there. Um, Try to keep everything as positive as you can and be a strong leader. Um, the last thing to not say is don't. So it's important to make sure that because at this point we. Um, I'm not sure if everybody, Bobby's pinging more out than in for some reason. I, hopefully, Phil, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, well, hopefully on the recording, um, this will this will what the important things that Bobby's saying will come across. Um, here's another thing to don't talk about. Uh, don't start talking about that. Well, you know, the experts are saying this is going to happen again, happen again in the fall. The experts are saying there won't be a vaccine for maybe more than two years because the all clear can't really be called until there's a vaccine. Don't talk about the fact that the RNA virus of COVID-19 uh, can morph into something 
else and then we'll be at it again. Um, those are really things that you have to, if, if people start saying that, if they start asking about that, say, you know, yeah, I'm aware of that, but uh, I think it's important that we look forward. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the looking at things through rose colored glasses or being a Pollyanna is a smart thing to do. It isn't. I would acknowledge, yes, there is danger, but you need to remember that the smartest people on this planet with limitless amounts of money from around the world are focused on finding a vaccine. Now, let's try to look at it that way. Don't talk about when you were a kid, like when I was, there was polio uh, or the Spanish flu, you know, or the black plague. Uh-uh, that's, that's going in the wrong direction. Phil, something to add? Or Bobby, are you back on? I'm back. I'm sorry for the connection, the communication connection there. Okay, go ahead, Bobby. Soldier on. All right, so let's move to the, the fourth point, which would be expectations of the team and the commitment from the doctor. Um, I, I personally plan to make sure that we're in the practice at least two days prior to ever seeing any patients so that we can get back on the same page. We're going to have a new game plan. The conversations that we are talking about today, having with our team, that's when we're going to utilize um, that, that block of time. So we've got to get back on the same page. I think it's also important to ask your team to plan to stay for at least 30 minutes at the end of the day to do a recap at the end of each day, probably for the first couple of weeks so that, that we can alter and, and adjust accordingly as we need with this new day and age of practice that we're going to be experiencing. Um, remind, as a reminder, we are a customer service center for patients. So it is going to be important to kick that up into high gear when we go back. Um, make sure that we're thanking every patient and parent for coming to their appointment. We've missed you. It's so great to see you. Um, but we've got to kick the customer service into overdrive when we come back. But, but just re reflecting in, make sure that we're going to check in with our team at the end of each day um, and make sure that you're back into the office a couple of days before you actually see patients so that you can get your, your pathways down. Yeah, I think that um, uh, it's it, of our ne this, by the way, is my COVID do. If you're wondering, I haven't I haven't been shorn for an extent, but I digress. Um, I think is the team needs some answers, uh, and our next um, seminar with all of you, of course, is next Tuesday when we talk about orientation of the patient families and and planning ahead. But I think the team needs to hear very quickly this underscoring of what Bobby just mentioned, that our primary concern is everything will be safe. In that, I think it's important to say will be safe, not needs to be safe. It will be that way in this office. We will meet, we will exceed every safety standard once we know what those standards are. Martha Ann or Bobby, sorry, Bobby, you had something else? No, 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 Martha Ann's can add. No, I mean, I totally, that's what I plan to do is to, um, I mean, I also have to be mindful that some of our staff got to get home and teach their kids or trade off with their husbands, but I might do my huddles at the lunch hour and be providing lunch yeah. for those first, first week. And we work out the kinks there and trying to figure out, cause some of them might, may not be able to stay after five, um, and just work through the kinks of. Um, and it will probably trim some fat out of the practice. I mean, not staff wise or any of that, meaning where was I redundant? Where was I kind of slow? Where was I, you know, I think the doctors are gonna all need to be, but be on point when we're in the clinic. Um, but I also think we need to be prepared for long conversations, at least my emergency patients that I've seen have, you know, you're gonna end up saying, how are you doing? And then the answer, you, you just stop talking and the answers are long. Um, I would say every single one of my emergency patients have been gut-wrenching, tearful stories of what's happening in their life. Yeah. So it's like you're kind of counterintuitive, like you're thinking, oh, well, maybe I can do my recalls faster. But if you're in talking to your families, it may not happen that way, you know? I, I think you make a great point. And what is our initial conversations going to be? We can't ignore the elephant in the room. And Jerry said it best the other day, the question is, how are you doing today? 
to the parent. Not how are you doing? How are you doing today? Because today's going to be different than yesterday was, and it's going to be different than tomorrow. So I think that was a great way to phrase that, Jerry, was how are you doing today? Yeah. Something else to remember is we probably are going to have some connection to somebody who's had this, who has almost died from this, or someone who has passed away. So I think the script, and this is our fifth point under scripted communication is the script for our team is that we hope for the best outcome is what we say to a parent when they tell us their situation. We don't say we hope they get better or we hope that they improve because they may not. And so I think it's important to use that neutral statement of we hope for the best outcome. Um, yeah, I think that's really important and acknowledging that this is a terrible situation Bobby mentioned that right in the beginning. You have to acknowledge it, that, that it is terrible. And um, I, I, as far as having a go-to phrase, saying, I'm hoping for the best, I, it's, very, it's non-denominational, it's non-judgmental, uh, saying things like, well, you know, you're, you're, I'm sorry your dad passed away, he's in a better place. Um, well, maybe they don't believe that. Maybe yeah. they think their dad's place is right here, right now. But if yeah. you say, I'm hoping for the best, I just received, by the way, uh, and I'll turn it back over to Bobby. I want to mention to all of you, uh, Gay Lowry, and a lot of you know Gay Lowry Consulting, she just texted me that she is sending samples of consents for teledentistry. Now, I will find out where she, uh, where, how she received those. But um, she just pinged me with that one. So once I see those, and I may even check with Larry Gerald about this and after I check with Gay, uh, I will send those forward to Phil, Bobby, Martha Ann, and I'm sure it'll get posted with the right permission, whoever needs the permission, uh, uh, on IPDO. So you really should be looking for that. I'll be sending it out to all the Nathos people as a separate email. Bobby? Uh, I, I want to uh, tell uh, these people that are texting in our colleagues some great, great concerns. And let's, this one's coming up a couple times that there's concern about physical distancing for team meetings or at lunch. And I agree. Um, this may mean you're eating lunch in your, your open bay <laughs> where you can spread out or even in your reception room. Yes. Um, but we don't know what's coming down the pipe in terms of recommendations. But at some point, we're going to have to figure out for our own personal space how do we physically distance ourselves um, but what how we can we still also meet as a team uh, one of the things that just came through or uh, came through earlier from uh, Dr. Meesk um, she said we are getting a lot of projects I think everybody can see this chat this is an interesting I think everybody can see the chats isn't that right Phil yeah everybody should be able to see it yeah it was one of the first ones that uh, that that came in so you might take a look at that. That's interesting information. Uh, Bobby? Um, as, as we kind of start to wrap this up, one of the most common questions that I've, I'm anticipating from parents is I pay for dental insurance to be seen twice a year. And oh, yeah. we've had this huge chunk of time where, I mean, I, I cannot mathematically make it work to reschedule all of the patients, the recall patients that we've missed. So this is when we're gonna to have to develop a script with our team on how do we answer those patients who challenge us with those questions and other ones as well. But being prepared, making sure that your team has a confident answer in their mind, they're like, we've practiced this, we've scripted this, that's gonna be the best way to deliver that information when you get hit with those questions. Ed Rick just texted in that the American, I misspoke, the AAPD, according to Ed Rick, does have informed consent forms for teledentistry on its website. Um, so everyone needs to be certain to check that. Yeah, Bobby? I believe there's also um, a form that uh, is a, a permission form whenever you see a patient, at least on emergencies right now, that states that they are at risk for COVID-19 and that it's a specific consent form um, that is has been developed during this time. That's something we can get out to you as well. But I can't remember who posted that, but that, that, that is available for us as well. Yeah, there's one uh, that's being developed right now by Larry Gerald in orthodontics, uh, for, ortho in, for orthodontics 
or uh, specifically, and I'd like you to note that I said for orthodontics, not for orthodontists. <laughs> right. Um, final comments, Phil. Yeah. You know, if I was going to sum up one takeaway from this conversation, it's that I think we have to be prepared to not like when we talk about ramping up our schedules are not gonna be ramped up. I think you know part of the mitigation is gonna be this kind of how we schedule so that way we take into account the, the safety factor. And I think what, and it, as far as it relates to team, I think, you know, Martha Ann, you made some great points about how team members are gonna to need to get home to their kids. And those of us that, that run longer schedules or have a tendency to run over, I mean, we're gonna to have to really pay attention to the needs of our team members because if they get stressed, they're going to be more susceptible to getting sick. Yes. And when we're just ready to get going, the last thing we need is for them to get sick. So I think that's going to be a tough thing for a lot of us to do. You know, look, I, I have a very large office that I help run and um, I have to be prepared and my leadership team does that we're going to have to scale up slowly or at least paying attention to, to our team's schedule, their personal schedule so they can have their personal time. And look, you know, I'd like to think that a lot of us, now that we've had some, some downtime, are going to also try to make sure that we balance a little bit more of this work-life balance. You know, I, you know that's, a, that's another follow-up for a different time. But no, I just want to emphasize that. I think a lot of us are going to struggle with that because we feel the financial pressure to ramp up to be able to pay the bills. And that's a realistic thing. But I think that, you know, we all know the cost of replacing a good team member is going to outweigh any of those early surges we might want to do. So I think that's probably going to be one of the more difficult conversations. And I just would encourage everyone to have that with their leadership team. Um, I, I'm not sure if these uh, chats can be printed and distributed. So I'll mention that if you're not, if you haven't looked at the chats or if you can hold on to them somehow, there's some quite interesting information. Uh, Jed Best, uh, the uh, effervescent and lovely New Yorker himself. I believe that some states do not allow charging for teledentistry. So you better check with your state. And then uh, Dan, um, I don't have a last name, said that I think that Texas is the only, Texas is the only state still forbidding teledentistry. So point well made, Jed Best, check with your state. Martha Ann, final comments, please. I mean, I think, I think the critical point is, as Bobby reiterated, is just positive communication. Um, you know, get in touch with yourself, which I think through the happiness lecture, um, she said, I'd be present in the moment and not be checking your phone and being distracted that when you're in the moment with another human being, be present in that moment. And the other pearl that science shows that when you extend gratitude, and if you can do it in person, that's the best. But if you can do it in a handwritten note, that's second best. It gives you, in time, more than 60 days of positive feelings in the human body. So it's one of the greatest things of healing is to express gratitude based in science. Um, so I think all of those pearls of however you prefer to communicate, I think are, um, it's so um, appropriate at this time. Well, my final comment is that uh, all of you that know me know I'm no Pollyanna and I'm not uh, an emperor looking through rose colored glasses, but I will remind everyone of those times when you agonized over a situation, what if, what if, what's gonna happen, or possibly waiting for test results that turned and everything turned out okay. Now I'm not saying I'm a Pollyanna, I'm saying once this is resolved one way or another, you won't get the time back that, uh, that you spent in the, in the dark worrying about what was going to happen. Well, I would like to. <laughs> Come on, Bobby. Let's see it, baby. <laughs> I hope you appreciated my field of coaching right here. <laughs> You're oh, we field, we appreciate you all the time, baby. <laughs> all right, we'll we'll see all of you. We'll see all of you next uh, next Tuesday. We'll all be champions. <laughs> <laughs>